Are we still in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10 tonight? By nature, we are prideful. We like to talk about ourselves. We like to talk about what we have. We like to talk about our accomplishment, about the good things that we have done. We don't really care to hear about the accomplishments of others. Even when it comes to God, we are not that excited to hear about what he has done. God has always existed, and he has done a lot of stuff. He created everything that exists. The Bible tells us that it was his good pleasure to do that. It pleased him to do what he did. Even creating us, the sinful people, it was his good pleasure. Now, some people resent that. They do not like the fact that they were created for God's good pleasure. Oh, well, that's life. Consider the alternative, not being created at all. This evening in our text, Paul is going to talk about the work of God. We will see that it is indeed a wonderful work. And all of it because it pleased God. So turn Galatians 1 verse 10 as we continue where we stopped last week. We saw that a chapter of three parts, all dealing with grace. This book is the a letter of grace. So the first part was the ground of grace and then the departure from grace and the source of grace. Last week we covered the first two parts. Today we'll take the last part. If you remember in his opening, in his salutation, Paul introduced us to the gospel of grace. He talked about the ground of grace. He said that Jesus gave himself for our sin according to the will of God our Father. He introduced us to the doctrine of salvation by faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is sufficient for salvation. There is nothing to add to it. He told us about the situation in the church. Some believers were turning away from the gospel of grace. They were turning to a different gospel, and Paul warned them not to go for it, even if it came from an angel from heaven. And to defend themselves, some religious leaders started to question the apostle. Who are you? Why are you teaching these things? What authority do you have? They wanted to cast doubt on his message. And sometimes you bring the message to someone, and they will try to find fault with you. They attack the messenger so that they don't have to receive the message. It's a trick of the devil. So <clears throat> in this section, Paul will defend his apostleship, his right to speak, and in doing that, he will show us the work of God. He will declare that it pleased God. Here he will talk about the source of grace tonight. So Galatians 10 Galatians 1, verse 10, Paul continues, he says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men. For I neither received it from men nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here Paul gets straight to the point he mentioned, the source of the gospel of grace. It certainly does not come from him. He did not invent that. He preached it, but did not invent it. The gospel of grace does not come from some man, verse 11, 
Paul did not receive it from any man, he said. It came through the revelation of Jesus Christ, verse 12, came from him. Many times we seek to persuade God. We can become very persuasive in prayer as though our prayer could actually persuade God. People think they can move God's will, God's mind. We should not want to change the mind of God. Why not? Because he knows so much better than we will ever know. It would be foolish to try to change God's mind. And yet many people come to God and they do. They come with their best sales pitch you've ever heard. Oh, Lord, if you only allow me to get this car, Lord, I will pick up people and I will bring them to church every week. God knows better. You may do it one week to show the car, and that'd be it. We cannot fool God. Paul was certainly not trying to persuade God. He knew better. He knew that God cannot be persuaded by our argument. And God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. He is omniscient. He knows everything. So we cannot fool him. Prayers are not to change God's mind. Some people, they think it is. Okay, I'm going to pray. I'm going to change God's mind. Prayers are not for that at all. Prayers are to put us in harmony with what God wants to do, in harmony with his will. God is not ignorant of what is happening on earth. He is not ignorant of what is happening to us. He knows all things. Jesus said, if you remember, that the Father knows what we need before we ever ask him. That would be scary if God would not know what we need until we tell him. What kind of God would he be? Oh, really? I did not know that. You need this? Oh, my, that's news to me. Prayers are not to inform God. They're not to persuade God, but they are for us to be in tune with God, to be in tune with his will, to be on the same page, if you will, with God. Then Paul asked a second question in verse 10. Am I trying to please men? Am I trying to win men's approval? Am I trying to be popular with people? This is a snare. This is a trap that many fall into it. It is caused by the fear of men, and the fear of men is also known as peer pressure. Solomon said in Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of, ma of men, peer pressure, brings a snare. It leads to compromise to do things you normally would not do if the pressure was not there. Remember Abraham, Isaac, both lied about their wife. David acted like a fool, dripping saliva. Jeremiah ran. Peter denied Christ. Pilate condemned Jesus, all because of the fear of men. Even King Saul he broke God's order, the fear of men, all because they were seeking to please men. Paul was not a man pleaser. Look at his statement in verse 10. If you please men, you are not servants of Christ. It is not possible to be men pleasers and servants of Christ. Today, pastors, teachers want to be men pleaser. They are not servants of God. It will be one or the other. You're going to please men or you're going to please God. While serving Christ, you will offend people. Is this a, a given? You're going to say things that people really don't want to hear. And if you're a man pleaser, you're going to avoid those things. You will want a crowd that is big. You will want offering coming from all over the place. 
and you will not offend the people. You'd be a man pleaser, but that disqualifies you from being a servant of Christ. A servant is not to try to please men, but to please God. Paul's enemy were probably accusing him of changing the message to suit his audience. So he asked that question, am I trying to please men or God? Obviously, he was not trying to please men because they hated his teaching about only one way to heaven. If Paul had changed his message to suit men, he would not have been a servant of Christ. He would be inviting the wrath of God upon him. Jesus was not a man pleaser. He displeased many people in his days. He denounced the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. This is a weakness of our culture today, across the board, not only the church. People do not say anything that might offend someone. So we have a nation of men pleasers, all quiet, all happy, all remaining in sin, and nobody says anything. That's why you get more and more foolishness of changing of sex, gender. Nobody says anything. We are men pleasers. Whether to please God or to please men is a question that you must ask yourself. You can listen to men's direction for your life or you can listen to God's direction for your life. The choice is yours. But do not forget Paul's statement here, that you are either man's pleasers or servants of Christ, but not both. To seek to please God may mean to stand alone or even to be laughed at. And that should not scare you. You should not fall into the trap of seeking to please God men, so that people will like you, so that you do not have to stand alone. You should be more interested in seeking to have a life that is pleasing God rather than have a life that is pleasing men. Paul would not have had all the aggravation, irritation that he had had he been a man please, pleaser. His speaking about the grace of God instead of keeping the law made a lot of people angry at him. But had Paul pleased men, we would not be here today. We would not have the glorious gospel of grace. Christianity would probably be just another Jewish sect. Thank God that he was not a man pleaser, and we should not be either. So Paul wanted to clarify something in verses 11 and 12. He made a statement of facts about the gospel that he preached, and he mentioned four things about it. He said, first of all, the gospel that I preach is not according to men. It is not the gospel of men. It is not fabricated by men. It has not been invented by men. It is the gospel of God. It is not the product of men or even the product of the church. Paul said that all scripture was given by the inspiration of God in 2 Timothy 3. Second thing, he said, I did not receive it from men. It was not delivered to Paul by some men or even some angel. He had not been given a scroll or a manuscript by, by some angel that needed some magic glasses to read. It is the work of God. Number three said, I was not taught this. I did not go to school for it. I did not enroll in a seminary to learn this. Nobody sat with Paul to teach him the gospel of grace. It was not man's invention. It came through revelation, not education. And last thing, number four, he said, it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. This is the source of it. It came directly from God. 
It is indeed God's word. We are not told how exactly or where the Lord revealed this great truth of the gospel to Paul. But we may be certain that it was a supernatural revelation to him. It is not the work of men or angel or the church. Paul goes on, says in verse 13, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and I returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterwards, I went into the region of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. So here Paul gives us a brief chronology of his life. And he cuts it in three sections. Verses 13 to 15 cover before his conversion, his birth, his persecution of the Christian, his zeal for Judaism. Verses 16 and 17 covers his conversion, the revelation of Jesus to him. And then verses 18 to 24 cover after his conversion, his introduction to the church. To reemphasize the fact that he had not been taught this gospel and had not received it from men, Paul talked about his past relationship with the church. Being such a good Jew, he persecuted the church of God. He went out of his way beyond measure to try to destroy Christianity. He con- consented to the murder of Stephen. Remember in Acts chapter 8, he made havoc trying to destroy the church. He entered house after house. He dragged men and women to prison just because they were Christians, and he was against it. Paul was certain that Jesus was an imposter. His message of salvation had to be a lie. He knew for sure that God had spoken through Moses. Everybody was in agreement with that, but not through Jesus of Nazareth. So after his relationship to the church, we have his relationship to the Jewish religion. He was progressing in the Jewish religion. He was recognized as a spiritual leader in Israel. And we know from Acts 22, verse 3, that he was a student of the famous rabbi Gamaliel, top top of the line. He was on his way to become a most respected young rabbi. Paul added in verse 14 that he had advanced in Judaism beyond his contemporaries, those studying with him. He was ahead of the bunch. He was more zealous for the religious tradition than any other student. His reputation as a zealous persecutor became known far and wide. So much so that the early church was still afraid of him even after his conversion. Paul's argument is that his past conduct as a persecutor of the church plus the drastic changes in his life prove that his message and his ministry were truly from God 
and not from men. No man could have done that to the life of this guy. No human agency could produce such drastic changes in a person's life. A drug addict that stopped like this and walked with God. A drunk who's been drunk for many, many years can just walk away from the bottle and he's not recognizable. That's the Lord. It pleased God to give him his natural life, he said in verse 15. And it pleased God to reveal his son to him and give him a spiritual life. Verse 16, we were given natural life by God, and then we were given spiritual life by God. And Paul inserted a few things in between these two life. He says, number one, God's hand was upon his life from the very beginning. God had set him aside, set him apart for his use from his birth. From the moment that he was born, he was set apart for God. And God still does that today. From birth, he knows what people will become. From the day you were born, God knew who you were going to be and what you were going to be. And number two, he says, God called him through his grace, not because he was so smart. Not because he deserved it. Later, Paul would call himself the chief of all sinners. Still, he was called by the grace of God. The conversion of Paul was a spiritual miracle. And he was what we would classify today the most unlikely person to be saved. When I lived in Hawaii, some people said that about me. The most unlikely man to be saved. But here I am today. Thank you, Lord. The death of Stephen, and especially his testimony before he died, might have affected Paul. He was there. He saw this poor young man being stoned with rocks and die. He was holding the coat. And that must have affected him. He talked about it later in Acts 22. It was humanly impossible for Rabbi Saul to become Apostle Paul, apart from the miracle of God's grace. Paul knew he had been saved to serve, and so were you, saved to serve. Everyone is saved to serve. When people say are chosen by God, yeah, the selection is not to salvation, it is to service. You have been chosen by God for a task. God had a plan for you when he chose you. In verse 16, Paul adds what really pleased God, to reveal his son to him. And that's what God wants to do in each and every one of you. That's the work that God is seeking to accomplish in your life, to reveal his son in your life. And if that's all you do, reveal Jesus in your life, that's a great ministry. You are instruments through which Jesus is to be revealed to the world. You know and I know that sometimes we reveal a totally distorted picture of Jesus. When you yell and scream, you lose it. You're in the flesh. Oh, Lord, what a picture. Jesus is not like this. We are to reveal him to the world by our actions, not our words. Quite a responsibility. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart, come into your life, it was not only for you. Yes, he changed you. And he is still molding you into his image. But he is making a lot of changes in your life. Yes, but it was really for others to see him in you that he was revealed to you. That's the purpose why God called you. 
that you may reveal Jesus wherever you go. We live in a world of total darkness. They reject God. So we are walking Bible. We are walking little Jesus. Christian mean a little Christ. That's what we are, and that's why God called us. <coughs> Paul did not immediately start preaching among the Gentiles. To do that, he said, would have been premature, and he would have been in the flesh, he says, verse 16. Starting with verse 17, we have the list of events following Paul's conversion. Five things. Number one, he said he did not go to Jerusalem where the apostles were. That would have been the natural fleshly thing to do. Um, I'm new with God. Let me go see those heavy apostles. To go tell them that he had been specially called by God to join them in the work of God. Hey, guys, I'm here from God to help you. I've been specially called by God to be here. No, he did not do that. He did not go to Jerusalem. Instead, he says in verse 17, I went to Arabia. There's nothing there. He remained there for three years. He gave himself to prayer and meditation, studied God's word, and time alone with the Lord. This was for his personal spiritual growth. It is necessary to be prepared by the Holy Spirit before we go anywhere and do anything for the Lord. And this is probably when Paul actually received the revelation of Jesus that he mentioned in verse 12. We are not to despise the days of little things. God does not produce overnight wonders. He takes time in the work that he does in his people's life. God's timing is perfect. He is never late. He's never too early. Look out for new converts who will take off like rockets right after their conversion. And they are going to serve God. They will either get hurt or they will hurt others. Paul did not do that, and no one should do that. Then number three, he says, he returned to Damascus. Again, he took the same road where the Lord had appeared to him when he was on his way to wipe out the church. But this time he was going for a different reason. He was going to preach the gospel of grace. Apparently, the basket incident of Acts 9 when they let, let him down in a basket, that took place during that time. The Jews in Damascus plotted to kill him, and the disciples took him by night and let him down in a large basket. So we can honestly say that he was a basket case, not only Moses. And then number four in verse 18, he says, he visited Jerusalem then. This was three years after his conversion. And it seems that his main purpose was to go visit Peter. Acts 9.26 tells us that the disciples in Jerusalem were still afraid of Saul. He had a tough time joining them in fellowship. And it was one man, Barnabas, who helped him to be accepted by the apostle. The apostles were suspicious of him. And the Jews were trying to kill him. His life was in danger in Jerusalem. So he only stayed there 15 days. He said, that was enough. And he only saw Peter and James, he says in verse 18. And Paul mentioned in verse 19 that the James that he saw was specifically the Lord's brother or half-brother. Same mother and the father. It was not James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, son of thunder, was not that one. This is another confirmation that Mary did not remain perpetual virgin, as some churches teach. She had other children after Jesus. Four brothers are mentioned by name in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark. The Bible also mentioned that he had sisters, half-sisters. How many? We don't know. Could have been a bunch of them. And that upset some people. The truth is upsetting to people who have been lied to and been believing a lie for so long that eventually they refuse to accept the word of God 
over the tradition of men. In verse 20, this verse is a personal note from Paul to confirm that he was not lying. He had been accused by the false teachers of lying. And here before God, he confirmed that he was telling the truth, not lying. And number five, the last thing he says, he said that he returned home to Tarsus in verse 21. He passed through Syria. He went through Cilicia, his home province, where Tarsus was. No details are given to us as to how Paul's family and friends received him. It appears that they did not receive him too well. There is no record anywhere in the Bible of any of them helping him in his ministry. Only one occasion, one nephew really helped him out when he heard that they were going to kill Paul, and he went to the governor, and so one nephew helped him in his entire family. There is no mention either of a wife. He had to be married in order to be part of the Sanhedrin council. That was a requirement. You have to be married. Maybe she had left him after he became a Christian, or maybe she died and he was a widower. But we have no detail. Obviously, to God, it's not important. Married, single, big family, little family, you serve the Lord. Paul remained in Tarsus two or three years until Barnabas came to Tarsus in Acts 11.25. And he asked him to help him in Antioch, that's Antioch, Syria, not California, in Acts 11.26. Paul mentioned in verse 22 that he never he had never met face to face any of the Christians of the churches of Judea. They would not have known him if he would have walked right next to them on the street. Even though they did not know him, they had heard about the man, verse 23. They had heard that the one who persecuted the church was trying and was trying to destroy it was now preaching salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. You talk about a changed life, a man who persecuted the church, who wanted to kill all Christians, was now not only a Christian, he was a preacher. He was bringing others to Christ. And what was the result of that? It's in verse 24. As a result of Paul's conversion, the people gave glory to God. For what had happened to Saul of Tarsus, they glorified God. And that should be the result of your conversion. People should glorify God in you, those who knew you before you were born again. If they don't, that's different. They knew Paul before he was saved. And when he was saved and the way that he served God and he walked with God, men, they glorified God. People should be able to see what God has done in your life and give glory to God. So in the final part of the chapter, Paul defended his apostleship. First, he revealed a few things about himself. He mentioned that while he was climbing the religious ladder of success, he was intercepted by Jesus Christ. It took more than religion and legalism to turn the persecutor into a preacher. That's a change from persecutor to preacher. It took the gospel of grace to do it. It took the power of the living God. That confirmed that God is not dead. People at home, oh, does God do miracles? But that's the Old Testament, New Testament. God does miracles all the time. Just changing the life of a person, make a persecutor, a preacher, that's a miracle. To have an old man, 75, 76 years old, to turn to Christ is a miracle. I baptized one lady in the, the church we used to go to, what was the town? Annapolis. And I had a hard time. Uh, do you think I mope sometime in the pulpit? 
I baptized this woman. Her name is Rina. I'll never forget. She looked just like my mother. And she had just come to the Lord. And in the water there, I was going to baptize. She was asking me why. Why did my church never told me that? Why did my church hid this important information? Why nobody told me? She was 76, and she died shortly after that. So it takes the gospel of grace. It takes the power of the living God to change people. Paul explained the characteristics of his conversion experience this way. He says in verse 15, God did it. Also in verse 15, God did it by grace. In verse 16, he says, God did it through Christ. Also in verse 16, God did it for the sake of others. And in verse 24, God did it for his glory. Then he also revealed a few things about the work of God. We see that it pleased God to do four specific things. It pleased God to give us his word, the gospel, the good news, verses 11 and 12. The Bible that we have is the work of God. Paul received it from God, not the work of men, not the work of angels, not even the work of the church. So it pleased God to give us his word. Number two, it pleased God to give us natural life. Verse 15, our natural birth is the work of God. It's not the work of your mom, your dad, the sperm, the this, the that. It is the work of God. He created you, not you yourself. He formed you in your mother's womb, the Bible says in Psalm 139. We exist because God created us. We are not the result of evolution. We do not come from monkeys, even though at times we act like them. So it pleased God to give us his word. It pleased God to give us natural life. It pleased God to save us. We see in 1 Corinthians 1 21 that it pleased God to save those who believe. Our salvation is the work of God. He called us through his grace, verse 15, and reveal his son to us, verse 16. So whenever Paul spoke about his conversion, it was always with the emphasis that God did it. Some prideful people, they take the glory, they take the credit even for being saved. Oh, I was faithful to the church, and I was in the Bible, and I learned a lot, and I grew spiritually a lot. They have all kind of things. No. It's God, man. God did it. Jonah said, chapter 2, verse 9, salvation is of the Lord, not you. And then the last one in verse 16 here, it pleased God to choose us and to call us to serve. Our ministry is the work of God. He chose Paul to preach his son among the unbelievers there. God chose us for service, not for salvation. He wants us to preach him. He wants us to reveal him to people. God called Paul to win others. And he wants to use you as well to win others. A man who knows much about Christ will talk about Christ. A person who knows Christ will preach Christ. So that's why it is so important. My job is important to make sure that you know God, you know Christ, so you can make him known to others wherever you go. Make sure you receive no glory from men but that men see God in you and see you in God. We are nothing. To him be the glory. It pleased God to give his son to you. It pleased God to save you. So you should live a life that pleases God. Shall we pray? Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for that 
good news that we hear from Paul, how you called him and how he gave you the credit, the glory. And I pray that we would learn, Lord, not to be prideful, even though pride is inside of our old nature and it constantly trying to resurface and take the lead. We need to keep it down. We are nothing. God is the one. He has done everything. So help us, Father. Give us strength. Give us boldness to be able to represent God, to represent Christ the way that you want us to represent him. I know at times we fail. We're in the flesh. We're angry. We're disappointed. Things happen that we don't like, and we don't represent Christ too well. Forgive us, Lord. We want to turn from that and return to continue to be uh, representing the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Had Paul continue in the Jewish religion the way that he was going, he would have been the greatest rabbi Israel has ever known. He was above all the other students. He was ahead of everybody. He was zealous. He would go into the houses, break doors down, Grab people, men, women, small, big, tall. He grabbed them, bring them into prison. And he made quite a name for his, himself, known, known throughout Israel. And then he was knocked off his high horse, like all prideful people should be knocked down from their high horse. And now he humbled himself. And still, people were afraid of him because of his reputation. But he did a lot of good. And he's telling us here, God did it. It was not him. He doesn't take zero credit. Show me where in all the verses we read him, where he takes a little bit of credit or put his head a little bit in the light. He does not. God did it. He did it to Christ. He did it for me. He did it for my... When I was born, God did it. And the same with you. Whoever you are, whatever you have, God did it. You may have will and deal to buy that house, and you may have sacrificed and put money aside and borrow the right place, little interest. You may take the credit. Don't. God did it. If he would, if he did not want you to have that house, that, that thing, you would not have it, period. Let God be God. Don't step in his place. Don't take the credit for what he does and continue to remain humble servants of the Lord. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. May he bless the rest of this week. May he protect you, keep you safe, and may you walk humbly with the Lord all the days of your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.